Continuing the Varieties of Religious Experience, A Study in Human Nature by William James. And obviously that's a reprint, so um, we are still in the circumscription of the topic. But if you say this, it will only show the more plainly how much the question of definition tends to become a dispute about names. Rather than prolong such a dispute, I am willing to accept almost any name for the personal religion of which I propose to treat. Call it conscience or morality. If you yourselves prefer and not religion, under either name, it will be equally worthy of our study. As for myself, I think it will prove to contain some elements which morality, pure and simple, does not contain, and these elements I shall soon seek to point out. So I will myself continue to apply the word religion to it, and in the last lecture of all, I will bring in the theologies and the ecclesiasticisms and say something of its relation to them. In one sense, at least, the personal religion will prove itself more fundamental than either theology or ecclesiasticism. Churches, when once established, live at second hand upon tradition, but the founders of every church owed their power originally to the fact of their direct personal communion with something they considered to be the divine. Not only the superhuman founders, the Christ, the Buddha, Muhammad, but all the originators of Christian sects have been in this case, so personal religion should still seem the primordial thing, even to those who continue to esteem it incomplete. Now, at the root of it, I mean, not as clear as Muhammad, but you can definitely find in the Bible and the, um, the Buddhist scriptures the idea that the, the power, knowledge, and presence of Buddha and Jesus were definitely limited. There are, it is true, other things in religion chronologically more primordial than personal devoutness in the moral sense. Fetishism and magic seem to have preceded inward piety historically, at least our records of inward piety do not reach back so far. And if fetishism and magic be regarded as stages of religion, one may say that personal religion in the inward sense and the genuinely spiritual ecclesiasticisms which it founds are phenomena of secondary or even tertiary order. But quite apart from the fact that many anthropologists, for instance, Javons and Fraser, expressly oppose religion and magic to each other. It is certain that the whole system of thought which leads to magic, fetishism, and the lower superstitions may just as well be called primitive science as called primitive religion. Sort of the magical Egypt point, right? It's not just religion as far as like some church or, you know, how, how people derisively say the word religion. It's science of consciousness and other things, right? The question thus becomes a verbal one again, and our knowledge of all the, these stages of thought and feeling is in any case so conjectural and imperfect that further discussion would not be worthwhile. Religion, therefore, as I now ask you arbitrarily to take it, shall mean for us the feelings, acts, and experiences of individual men in their solitude so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider the divine. Since the relation may be either moral, physical, or ritual, it is evident that out of religion in the sense in which we take it, theologies, philosophies, and ecclesiastical organizations may secondarily grow. In these lectures, however, as I have already said, the immediate personal experiences will amplify will amply fill our time, and we shall hardly consider theology or ecclesiasticism at all. We escape much controversial matter by this arbitrary definition of our field, but still a chance of controversy comes up over the word divine if we take it in the definition in too narrow of a sense. There are systems of thought which the word usually calls, the world usually calls, religious, and yet which not positively assume a god. Buddhism, in this case, popularly, of course, 
the Buddha himself stands in place of a god, and you find reference that maybe Buddha worshipped, but they didn't. He didn't worship the angels or shining ones and stuff. Um, but in strictness, the Buddhistic system is atheistic. Modern transcendental idealism, immersionism, immersionism, for instance also seems to let God evaporate into abstract ideality, not a deity in concreto, not a superhuman person, but the imminent divinity in things. The essentially spiritual structure of the universe is the object of the transcendentalist cult. In that address to the graduating class at Divinity College in 1838, which made Emerson famous, the frank expression of this worship of mere abstract laws was what made the scandal of the performance. These laws, said the speaker, execute themselves. They are out of time and space and not subject to circumstance. Miscellanies, 1864, page 120 is where this comes from. Thus, in the soul of man, there is a justice whose Retributions are instant and entire. He who does a good deed is instantly ennobled. He who does a mean deed is by the action itself contracted. He who puts off impurity thereby puts on purity. If a man is at heart just, then in so far is he God. The safety of God, the immortality of God, the majesty of God do enter into that man with the justice. If a man dissemble, deceive, he deceives himself and goes out of acquaintance with his own being. Character is always known. Thefts never enrich. Alms never impoverish. Murder will speak out of stone walls. The least of a mixture of a lie, for example, the taint of vanity, any attempt to make a good impression, a favorable appearance, will instantly vitiate the effect. But speak the truth in all things alive or brute or vouchers. And the very roots of the grass underground there do seem to stir and move to bear your witness. For all things proceed out of the same spirit, which is differently named love, justice, temperance, in its different applications, just as the ocean receives different names on the several shores which it washes. Insofar as he rose from those ends, a man bereaves himself of power auxiliaries. His being shrinks. He becomes less and less a moat, a point until absolute badness is absolute death. The perception of this law awakens in the mind a sentiment which we call the religious sentiment and which makes our highest happiness wonderful is its power to charm and to command. It is a mountain air. It is the embalmer of the world. It makes the sky and the hills sublime, and the silent song of the stars is it. It is the beastitude of man. It makes him illimitable. When he says, I ought, when love warns him, and when he chooses, warn from on high, the good and great deed, then deep melodies, wander through his soul from supreme wisdom. Then he can worship, and be enlarged by his worship, for he can never go behind this sentiment. All the expression of this sentiment are sacred and permanent, in proportion to the purity. They affect us more than all other compositions. The sentences of the olden time which ejaculate this piety, are still fresh and fragrant. And the unique impression of Jesus upon mankind, whose name is not so much written as plowed into the history of this world, is proof of the subtle virtue of this infusion, such as the Emersonian religion. The universe has a divine soul of order, which soul is moral, being also the soul within the soul of man. But whether this soul of the universe be a mere quality, like the eye's brilliancy, or the skin's softness, or whether it be a self-conscious life, like the eye's seeing, or the skin's feeling, is a decision that never unmistakably appears in Emerson's pages. It quivers on the boundary of these things, sometimes leaning one way, sometimes the other, to suit the literary rather than the philosophic need. Whatever it is, though, it is active. As much as if it were a god, we can trust it to protect all ideal interests and keep the world's balance straight. The sentences in which Emerson, at the very end, give utterance to this faith 
are as fine as anything in literature. If you love and serve men, you cannot by any hiding or stratagem escape the remuneration. Secret retributions are always restoring the level when disturbed of the divine justice. It is impossible to tilt the beam. All the tyrants and proprietors and monopolists of the world in vain set their shoulders to heave the bar. Settles forevermore the ponderous equator to its line, and man to moat, and star and sun must range to it, or be pulverized by the recoil. And if you love and serve man to pulverize by the recoil, as a lecture from Lectures in Biographical Sketches, 1868, page 186. Now, it would be too absurd to say that the inner experiences that underlie such expressions of faith as this and impel the writer to their utterance are quite unworthy to be called religious experiences, the sort of appeal that Emersonian optimism on the one hand and Buddhistic pessimism on the other make to the individual and the sort of response which makes to them in his life are in fact indistinguishable from, and in many respects identical with, the best Christian appeal and response. We must therefore, from the experiential point of view, call these godless or quasi-godless creeds. And sometimes that phrase is used in the respect that, well, not what we consider to be a god. You know, um... Oh, that's right, quasi-godless creeds. Religions. And accordingly, when in our definition of religion, we speak of the individual's relation to what he considers the divine. We must interpret the term divine very broadly as denoting any object that is godlike, whether it be a concrete deity or not. A lot of people say, oh no, we don't worship and we don't treat it, you know, you are treating it as a god. Stop it with that, you know. Um, a lot of people on the so-called left-hand path try to pull that one. Um, but the term godlike, if thus treated as a floating general quality, becomes exceedingly vague, for many entities have flourished in the religious history, and their attributes have been discrepant enough. What then is that essentially godlike quality, be it embodied in a concrete deity or not, our relation to which determines our character as religious as religious as religious men? It will repay us to seek some answer to this question before we proceed further. For one thing, gods are conceived to be first things in the way of being and power. They overarch and envelop, and from them there is no escape. What relates to them is the first and last word in the way of truth. Whatever then were most primal and enveloping and deeply true might at this rate be treated as godlike, and a man's religion might thus be identified with his attitude, whatever it might be towards what he felt to be the primal truth.